So Kelly, um, thank you so much again for the great introduction. Um, as she mentioned, I am a social worker currently working in the nonprofit sphere. Um, I don't know if uh, Kelly mentioned that I have been a migraine sufferer uh, since I was about 13 years old. Um, and I got involved in my, with Miles for Migraine um, with our first race in Philadelphia when in 2013. And ever since then, I've been involved in Miles for Migraine events and I served as um, the director of youth programs for Miles for Migraine before Kelly did. Um, so I am so uh, glad that I can be here and continue to share my expertise based on my own personal experience, as well as my social work um, experience and experience supporting migraine patients through Miles for Migraine. So again, thank you. Um, John, if you wanna share how this topic is close and near and dear to your life, feel free to go ahead as well. Yeah, and it's actually really tied in with, with Haley herself. And I, I'm just so grateful to her and to Miles for Migraine. So um, we attended as a family on the advice of my daughter Maddie's neurologist, a, uh, a, a youth camp, uh, a youth day camp event at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP. Um, I guess it was about five or six years ago. I've forgotten exactly how many years. Do you remember, Haley? I've, I've, I've forgotten. Maybe it was your second or third one, I think. Oh, you're, you're muted, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. My dog walked through the room, so I muted oh. myself. Um, but I imagine you probably first got involved in around 2016 in King of Prussia, and Maddie was um, a real leader among um, youth at our migraine camps, and we're so lucky to have your family involved. That's, that's very kind. And, and Haley was, um, there, there usually is a, um, a speaker who is uh, basically a, a kind of um, a, a migraine patient who, um, is kind of a success story in terms of um, accommodation and treatment and, um, you know, learning to live with it in a, in a, you know, productive and really good way. And Haley was that person in, in speaking and, um, and her mom is also a, a, a wonderful speaker and basic, basically an expert in this field, a psychiatrist who uh, really has, has developed a specialty in disability and in uh, kids with chronic pain and and so uh, in any event, they're, they're speaking and all of the other uh, information that came from that uh, youth day camp event really made a difference in our lives. And we hadn't, we had felt very much alone and, and almost as if we had never heard of chronic migraine, that Maddie was maybe the only person in the world who had this and we just didn't quite know what to do. And I think that's why her neurologist very kindly and wisely recommended that we go. And I think the gathering together um, was fantastic, and Haley herself was such a great role model, I think, uh, for Maddie, and, and great example for everybody. So I, um, I'm just grateful. And and after that, uh, some I was a prosecutor. Some friends of mine um, noticed that I was getting involved in this, and I was trying to um, get people in because, again, those who uh, are experiencing this, uh, and Maddie has several friends who've experienced this, um, and and classmates and others in her school. Um, we try to reach out and pull people in to events like this because um, it's, it's not very well known and gathering together is really, really helpful. Um, well, they saw that I was doing that and a position opened up at this wonderful uh, disability education law firm, McAndrews, that I'm really privileged to be a part of now. Um, and so I switched my specialty um, in my uh, early 50s and I'm uh, really enjoying uh, the stretch, the challenge, and this this great work. So that's kind of my uh, yeah. intro spiel. Absolutely. Thanks, John, and thanks to all of you for being here and being a part of this. So without further ado, um, welcome to this practical overview, and um, we will have interactive parts throughout and plenty of time for questions at the end. So feel free to add questions in the chat if you have them or save them to get the end, and we want to make sure we will answer all questions. Absolutely. And we introduced who we were. So without further ado, let's share the first poll, Kelly. Yes, I can do that. Let's see. Thanks everyone for your patience as we um, <laughs> launch into the technological aspect of this. We're really grateful that Zoom works as a platform for these virtual events. Okay, 
it should be there. Yep. Um, the first question is, if you are a student, what are you, like, what year are you? Go ahead and vote. I see many of you are. And these are all anonymous polls. So if a question for some reason you don't feel like sharing, um, I encourage you to share because we won't know who said what. And this will get a, help us get a sense of who is here um, and how to tailor any information throughout. All right. So uh, thank you for your participation. So middle school, we have two people who responded. 11th and 12th grade, we have seven. And I see a chat question. I would, yes, I would do the age level for your child if, if you're a parent. How about that? So there we go. Now that we've said that, we have um, one from elementary school, three from middle school, and seven in 11th or 12th grade, and one college age. Great. Great to know. I imagine we have a lot of people who are looking forward towards college and starting to have thoughts about what's next for you. Absolutely. All right. So um, let's just go in and um, sort of have an overview here of the special education and accommodation laws. Um, I, I just want to make it clear that special education is, is the term for um, sort of custom tailored education. I think a lot of people think of it as something different, but that's specifically what it means. And accommodation is a way of, um, of delivering the same educational content, but uh, with some sort of adaptation that makes it more available to you. And there are really three overall most important uh, laws that govern this, uh, the, the way of, of delivering these three things. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 is really the, the main one for most uh, migraine kids. Um, then there's the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA or IDEA. Um, and uh, that, th those differ and we're gonna talk about exactly how they differ a little bit. And then there's the third one, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which I think pretty much everybody has heard of just in terms of the physical modifications that had to be made like curb cuts and ramps and so on. Um, but really that's a good analogy because um, the ADA and Section 504, really what they require is access. Um, access to whatever it is that's being offered by the institution, by the school, uh, whether it's a public or private school, um, access. Um, and it, it differs, uh, the, the degree of access uh, differs depending on whether it's a public or private school, but um, it still requires that. And then the um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act uh, has a, a, a very much more specific uh, kind of meaning. So that's sort of an overview for that. Do you want to talk about the right. school theory, Haley? Sure. So some of you might already be familiar. Spoon theory is something that's really meaningful to a lot of migraine patients. Um, it was a story, an analogy developed um, by a young woman with who is suffering from another invisible disability. Um, and in explaining to a friend what it meant to have a chronic illness, she laid out a bunch of spoons and she said, if these spoons are energy in a day um, and you're allocating um, your energy resources, you know, if it's a spoon for getting dressed and a spoon for going to class and a spoon for feeding yourself a meal. As a person with a chronic illness, you just have fewer spoons. And so you run out much quicker. You have to be really strategic when you're planning with the spoons. And um, you both have fewer and tasks take more. And often by the end of the day, you run out of spoons. Um, John, would you like to explain how this applies to academic accommodations? Yeah, right. So you, you have to plan in advance um, and or your, you know, parents or, or teachers um, in order for you to sort of get through and learn the same material. Um, but it, it, it may require, um, you know, ways that uh, or for you to come up with or maybe with your with your doctor or with your, um, you know, advisor, psychologist, um, parents, 
uh, ways of learning that same material um, that, that take up less energy, fewer spoons. Um, and you're always, it's just, it's part of being um, a, a patient with migraine, and especially with chronic migraine or with new daily persistent headache, um, that you have to plan in advance. And in education, really what we're talking about is coming up with plans that are somewhat similar, that are the plans for the schools to follow that allow you, that sort of mesh with your own personal kind of spoon theory planning. Um, so, and there's, there's another thing that I think is, is important. This, this analogy um, is important in your learning self-advocacy and that's learning self-advocacy is really one of the big overarching goals of Miles for Migraine, of these team camps. Um, and um, it is something that we wanna try to help develop. And I think all of the Miles for Migraine programs wanna try to help develop. And um, using this analogy can be helpful to explain your situation to those who don't quite understand, especially those who are skeptical uh, of your invisible disability because you look fine and you may be getting really good grades, um, but it's much, much more of a struggle for you. Um, and and yeah. along the same lines of that, uh, just sort of one of the refrains of uh, Miles for Migraine is that migraine is not just a headache. It's a, it's a disease that has many, many different other symptoms that are pervasive. Um, and uh, I think that's an important thing just to keep in mind when you're talking with people and trying to get accommodation, both of you know, that analogy and that phrase. Uh, I, they were helpful, at least for my daughter, uh, in, and in yeah. our going ahead and, and working with her school to, to get accommodation. Were they helpful for you, Haley? Um, spoon theory, I didn't learn about it until pretty late in my migraine journey. Just to add on to the piece about self-advocacy, um, I want to be clear to everybody that that's a journey. It's a process. I um, was not always great at self-advocacy, and I got better over time. There was a period of time where my mom wrote all of the emails for me, and then there was a period of time where I signed them as from my mom and Haley, and then there was a period of time where I would write them and she would read them, and then I was sending emails by myself. And so don't feel embarrassed or ashamed by where you are on that journey towards self-advocacy. It's a process, and we're here to help you along the way. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I see something in the chat and I, I think this is a really good point. Um, the access can also include physical uh, aspects such as being able to enter a building because fragrances uh, sometimes are uh, terrible. Uh, Febreze, uh, carpet fresheners, air fresheners. I have to say, um, actually even at Penn, uh, Haley, you may not know this, but I spent a, a gap year working in the office of the, the dean and CEO at the medical school at Penn. And, and um, that particular office had um, a lemon air freshener that frankly just triggered me. And this is before I even realized that, that I myself have some of the migraine symptoms that run in my family. Um, I thought that only my dad did. No, I have some of them and that was one of the things. And frankly, it was just a real struggle to get rid of that, but we did. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, this is important. And that's right, accommodation can only happen after access um, to that, to, to the buildings is taken care of. And I completely agree. It doesn't get much attention, but it's a very important issue. Um, so actually maybe that segues a little bit uh, into this next slide, which is really about the differences between section 504 slash ADA and IDEA. Um, so let me just. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. No, no, no problem. Sorry. So talking about um, Section 504 is really focused more on, um, you know, the lack of discrimination, where it's a, it's an anti-discrimination statute, as is the ADA. Um, although the the ADA focuses a little bit more upon um, simple access, um, Section 504 also uh, does have a FAPE requirement, a free appropriate public education requirement um, in K-12 settings. And for that reason, a plan um, is often created to eliminate barriers to the education and to full participation uh, in school. So um, now, as you get older, um, as you go into college, 
Section 504 still applies, but there is no longer a plan that uh, needs to be created. Uh, some schools will create a plan, but they won't call it a Section 504 plan uh, or a Rehabilitation Act plan, uh, nor will they call it an ADA plan. Um, the the uh, access is provided without an alteration of a content or curriculum um, in, in Section 504. And uh, the, the reason I mentioned the ADA is it's a, it's a similar thing. And as, as you were saying in the, in the uh, chat and in comments, there are other aspects to the physical setting um, that need to be altered sometimes uh, for those who have migraine, like lights, like sound, like fragrance. Um, and so the ADA will uh, cover you there too. Um, so, so that's on the one hand, that's without alteration. Now the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act can also apply um, to uh, kids, teens, students who have migraine. Um, it's, it's a federal education statute that uh, it's not an anti-discrimination statute. Instead, it's a funding statute. It provides funding um, to institutions that ensure that students with disabilities are provided a free appropriate public education or FAPE. Um, and the way that that's done is an individualized education plan or an IEP uh, provides accommodations, basically bespoke uh, specially designed instruction or SDI and related services. Um, generally speaking, it's limited to about 13 categories, depending on how you count 12, 14. There are some that are sort of multiple categories, uh, but it, 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 so it does alter the content of the curriculum and um, in general can be thought of as, as something that at least in the migraine context would require a sort of more severe degree um, or maybe an overlap of other conditions that are covered by those 13. One of the 13 is other health impairment and migraine um, can be uh, classified as that. Uh, but it really depends that which, which one you're using depends I think on severity in general. Um, so um, Haley, do you have any, any comments as to that? I know you had both at, at different times. You... Yes, I have, I apologize, that's my, I apologize. Um, I will wait and take care of the dog and then I'm going to answer that question. Okay, sure, that's fine. So this uh, poll, Kelly, are you still here? Absolutely, so let me share the poll. Um, so it should be appearing on your screen. What type of academic academic accommodation plan do you have, if any? And if you don't, then just say I don't. I don't have one. All right. We'll take a few minutes or a few seconds, maybe up to a minute, and let you all answer. All right. People are changing their While answers. We do that. Thinking about it. Perfect. Sorry about my dog. She's gone now. Um, just to answer John's question, I had an IEP going through school. Um, that was in part because I also had a diagnosis of dyslexia. And so from a young age, I had the IEP and then the migraine diagnosis sort of seamlessly rolled into that. But also due to the severity of my migraine, um, a, an IEP would have naturally been a better fit for me since I needed more specialized, modified instruction than I would have otherwise um, with a less severe migraine disorder or without other coexisting conditions. Right, right. So All right. I, yeah, look, oh. Go ahead, Kelly. I was gonna say, um, the results are in. It looks like three people have a 504 plan, two people have an IEP, two also have a private school plan, one person says other, and four say, I don't have a plan. Right. That's helpful to know, so we know going forward that some people don't have plans yet. Right, and that was actually the case uh, when, when we first attended uh, this event. And this was one of the things that we did um, that was, I think, really helpful. Um, although implementation is always a struggle, at least um, with regard to invisible disabilities and in 504 plans, I think, in particular. So, but let's, um, let's talk a little bit more about that. I do see some, 
things in the chat. Maybe we could just deal with those right now. Um, so somebody's asking for a child going to college, must they have some plan like a 504 already in writing before accommodations can be made? You know, I'd say it's helpful. Um, would you agree, Haley? I, it's not mandatory, but it's helpful. Agreed. Um, yes. If you do not already have a testing plan in case um, or in, in place, you might need more testing to show that you need a plan in college. Exactly. Um, but right. often, even if you do have a plan in high school, you need to get retested anyway. Um, if there's any um, academic component with doctor's notes, you might be able to get around that. Um, it's certainly true for, for IEPs. It might be less so for um, very migraine specific accommodations. Right, right. Um, and then um, just in terms of, um, you know, homeschooling is, um, is both helpful and um, can, I mean, it's, it's necessary in some instances, um, but I would say there, there are lots of resources that um, can be provided on the side. And that's something that you might want to uh, look into if you haven't already, you probably have. But um, yeah, that's, that's something that um, you can talk about with whatever college accommodations office um, you end up utilizing, I would say. But let's, let's talk now about uh, Section 504 because this is really, um, I, I think really the, 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 the majority of migraine kids um, have a 504 plan. So this is, a, again, an anti-discrimination uh, uh, statute and it applies to, uh, applies to all recipients of federal funds. And that includes public schools, it includes some private schools. Uh, it includes most colleges, whether public or private. Um, but the procedural protections of it are less robust than those of the idea. Um, and that means that there can be more delay and that may require more advocacy on your part. And that's on top of the additional degree of advocacy that you have to be uh, utilizing because of this being an invisible disability and you're not being apparently affected. I mean, there's no, you're not in a wheelchair. You're, it's, it's not something that people see. And unfortunately, in, in our culture at least, seeing is often believing and uh, not seeing is disbelieving. Um, so that's the, the challenge of that. Um, the um, 504 applies all your life and it, it defines an individual with a disability far more broadly um, than IDEA does. So it's any person who has a physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more uh, major life activities, uh, or you have a record of such an impairment in the past, or you're regarded as having such an impairment. Um, so uh, there can be people who appear to have such an impairment. So learning is a major life activity. Um, so is reading, um, you know, all sorts of other um, specific activities are covered and pain um, and all of the other migraine disease symptoms are physical impairments. Um, so essentially you're covered, um, but you're covered to a, to a lesser degree once you're out of the K through 12, up to 21, up to graduation uh, time period. Um, so it's, it's birth through death, but the, the plan is only provided during K through 12. Um, and again, the, the idea of the accommodations is that it, it adapts the regular school curriculum um, so that you can, it's, it's essentially leveling the playing field so that you can access the education, the schooling just as adequately as your non-disabled peers. Um, it's like a ramp. It's, it's, think of it as, as like the ADA uh, for schooling, for, for a ramp. Um, and later, I think we'll talk a little bit about or, or maybe a lot, hopefully, about the specific accommodations that are the most helpful uh, for migraine patients. Um, it can also include, a 504 plan can also include special education and related services, meaning, um, well, some of the things that we'll list later on, uh, supports for school personnel and extended school year, meaning uh, the summer. Um, but again, there are fewer requirements for what has to be included in a 504 plan compared to an IEP. Um, in terms of getting accommodation, um, and this was something that was very helpful for us, um, who can help you get accommodation includes social workers, um, especially those who are affiliated with 
a comprehensive migraine center. Um, with, there's a, a list at the very end of this presentation of national comprehensive migraine centers. They're, they're a little bit hard to find, but they're in all major cities. Um, and if you uh, can't utilize a social worker there, you can have your, your doctor get in touch with a counselor or a psychologist or an administrator at the school. Um, in our own daughter's private school setting, um, we utilized the services of the social worker in CHOP's uh, Comprehensive Headache Center, uh, but we also had to advocate and work with the school psychologists and administrators and essentially put the plan together ourselves. It was a little more do it yourself than it would have been at a public school. Um, but in some ways, I mean, that has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the self-advocacy piece came into it a little bit earlier, I think, uh, for Maddie and for us. So I think that's, that's helpful. Um, IDEA is the, is the funding law uh, that we talked about before. And uh, I think some of, some of you had uh, a plan through this, a, uh, an IEP um, that, that provides FAPE. Um, and the school district under these have, have, have affirmative obligations uh, and they have to comply with pretty strict procedural protections. Um, so the main category, as I said, for migraine, for chronic migraine, uh, is other health impairment. But also, um, there is an overlap um, that I don't know if we have much time to discuss, but with TBI, with uh, concussion, traumatic brain injury, uh, it's, it's not completely understood yet. I understand um, medically from some of the medical presentations that I've heard, uh, but it seems like kids with chronic migraine may well be more susceptible to concussions. Um, and in addition, of course, uh, long-term uh, concussion symptom can be uh, post-concussion syndrome, which includes chronic migraine. So there's this kind of chicken and egg thing, and it was unclear in my daughter's case there. And also there are speech and, and language um, uh, difficulties that, that uh, migraine sufferers can encounter. And of course, visual impairment with, with aura can also be relevant. So these are some of the things that may push uh, migraine into the IDEA category from the Section 504 category. There's a, a really good example. I don't know if, um, have you all seen this? Serene Branson, the weather forecaster out in LA from KTLA, while she was giving, uh, she, she has chronic migraine although she apparently didn't realize that she had uh, language effects. And she was giving a weather forecast right after the Grammys and she had what looked to many viewers like a stroke where her language was completely impaired. Um, it's in the film Out of My Head and you can also find it uh, on the web and on, on YouTube. But it's, it's worth taking a look at because it, it will help if you haven't had this happen or even if you have, it'll help sort of understand what's going on um, a little bit better. Um, okay, so this is, the, the idea is not only for the student, um, it's also for the parent. It includes meaningful participation, but that brings up the, the point that when you move to college, which we'll be talking about later, especially Haley will be talking about, um, that um, there is a, an abrupt transition and Again, we were not aware of this until we went to this accommodation workshop at the first uh, youth camp that we attended. But um, there's a, a, an abrupt shift uh, due to uh, FERPA and HIPAA, the, the, the um, educational and uh, healthcare privacy laws that comes in, that, that, that kick in as soon as a, a, a kid goes to college where the parents will not have access to that information and the colleges are not allowed to share it unless the student uh, allows uh, for that. And so one thing that you want to talk about in advance is whether you want uh, to sign those waivers as soon as you get to school uh, or not. Uh, it may be a, a useful um, kind of self-advocacy and responsibility taking time there. Uh, Haley, you- To be clear, I'll- Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I, no, yeah. I did not mean to interrupt you at all. Um, in addition to uh, having to sign forms and releases if your parents might be involved, um, schools are also much less likely to be responsive to parents in college. So right. this is something for a lot of you to have in your mind as high school is a great 
time to prepare and think about how you're going to be dealing with this in college when if you're lucky, you know, and you have a very kind school, they might be willing to speak with your parents. But at many schools, my um, school where I went it included at Penn, um, they're not responsive to parents whatsoever, even if you do sign releases. So it's important to keep that in mind. Don't be scared, though. You will be ready by then. But it's something to keep in mind. I, I can say having relatives who are in the college and university setting who've dealt with that, it, it really does kind of pose a dilemma um, especially when, as is often the case, there's kind of a different version or maybe a different agenda from a parent versus a student. And part of what colleges are trying to do is to help you develop as an adult and take responsibility for your own, uh, you know, destiny and, and, and choices like that. So, I, you know, I can see it both ways. Um, so uh, in terms of, um, you know, what, what it's trying to achieve, the IEP is trying to achieve meaningful educational progress. And that's in all domains, not just academic, also social, emotional, behavioral, physical. So again, self-advocacy, becoming more independent. Um, in terms of um, what IEPs also can uh, deliver in terms of the next uh, slide here, this independence and self-sufficiency is sort of the, the first one, the specially designed, the bespoke instruction. The, Accommodations and supports are the sort of extra things uh, that, that, that come along. Transition services, meaning to college or to post-secondary uh, you know, activities, um, and the extended school year summer. Some of the related services are listed on the following slides. I don't think we need to run through them, but they're essentially anything from A to Z. I mean, it's a, it's a huge, it opens up a huge bevy of related services. Uh, which can be really, really helpful. Um, so if you need them, don't hesitate. Um, there really shouldn't be a stigma. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of places, but there shouldn't be a stigma around this. So in terms of um, contrasting, the really the purpose of a 504 plan is, is leveling the playing field and um, equal access and non-discrimination, whereas the purpose of an IEP is the, the educational benefits providing that specially designed or, or bespoke uh, instruction. Great. Time for another poll. All right. And we will touch on later on, by the way, how this relates to testing, um, SAT and ACT testing. Um, so I imagine some of you are having those questions, but that will be covered soon. So All right, the next this poll. question, yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to say, you just go ahead and read it. Do you have do you sometimes feel like you're getting an unfair advantage if you use accommodations? This is something that's really common. A lot of people feel this way. So it'll be interesting to see how this, how this group feels about this. Great, I'm surprised uh, so far, actually. I don't think we even have a single yes. Yeah, so it looks like eight people say no, and three people say no, but I feel my peers do. That's Nine great. That's really it. impressive. Yeah, wonderful. I'm really impressed. I feel like that's a big shift, honestly, since other times we've done this in the past and since other times I've talked to students at Miles for Migraine. Um, a lot of people have thought in the past that it was an unfair advantage that they were embarrassed or ashamed to use. So we probably don't have to go on as much of our spiel about how this is not an unfair advantage. Your headaches are a disadvantage. And that's why those ADA accommodations that level the playing field or more or the IEP services are so important because they help bring you from where you're down here really struggling with the disadvantage up to where your peers are. They're not putting you above your peers by any means. You have headaches and they don't and you deserve extra support to be able to learn effectively and be as comfortable as possible um, in school or in the case of right now, maybe at home doing virtual learning. So another poll. All right, here we go. If I can remember what number poll this is. Uh, here we go. So who has heard the phrase, but you don't look sick or but you don't look disabled or something similar?
I guess the question is, have you heard the phrase yes or no, as I, as I look at the answer? Um, 11 say yes, and one says no. Two say no. Okay. Three say no. There we go. <laughs> 11 yes and three no. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of the really big challenges of having migraine and invisible disability is some people, as John said, in our culture base, you know, what your status is as as a disabled or non-disabled person on what you look like. And if you don't have crutches or a wheelchair or anything indicating that you are facing additional challenges, but you are. And that's why having ways to talk about it with your peers, with your teachers, with um, le other administrative leaders at your school, that's why those are so important. Because without those self-advocacy skills, people will continue, unfortunately, sometimes to just say, but you look fine. Yeah, maybe we can just ask, um, I, I, well, or not just ask, I just want to um, quickly sort of summarize, yeah, skepticism uh, about invisible disabilities is just, is really high. And I know that my daughter encountered it uh, a lot, and we've talked a lot about it at these uh, workshops and camps that we've gone to, and, and also about the need to remind teachers and professors, even if you have a plan in place, um, they forget, because, you know, if you're doing well, um, and uh, if it seems like, uh, you know, you look okay, uh, they may just forget and you may not have to use it for a while. So um, that's something that, you know, again, the self-advocacy piece is important. Um, so here's some resources that might be helpful for that self-advocacy. Uh, the, um, the United States Department of Education, which um, calls itself ED, Education Department, the Office of Civil Rights, because by the way, all of these laws are civil rights laws. Uh, many people may not realize that, but this is part of civil rights laws. Um, this, they're, um, they put out a series of letters, and one of them is the civil rights of students with hidden disabilities under Section 504 that you can just present to your school um, or you can present to, to others, um, say to doctor's offices. That might be a helpful thing. <clears throat> just to let them know this is an important thing. Um, there's also, just this summer, I noticed an article in the New York Times by Andrew Solomon um, that I highly recommend. It's not particularly about migraine, but he has a couple of invisible disabilities, and he has written a book about those with invisible disabilities, and he's a very, very articulate writer. Um, there is an Invisible Disabilities Association that you might want to uh, take a look at on, on the web. Another organization that's excellent is um, the... Uh, Invisible Disabilities, uh, I'm sorry, it's the Disabled World website, and they have a section on invisible disabilities. Um, then there's Migraine.com, uh, an author named Katie Golden, who's very active in Miles for Migraine, um, I think on the West Coast, uh, has a couple of really good articles, but I think Images of an Invisible Illness is her best one. And then the, the site by Christine Miserandino, um, who came up with the Spoons Theory um, and is related to a friend of ours just by coincidence, um, has a website called But You Don't Look Sick. Um, and uh, that also is worth taking a look at. The, um, the ADA was amended in 2008 specifically to address, in part, um, invisible disabilities. Uh, it broadened the meaning of disability, broadened the meaning of major life activities and major bodily functions, um, so that um, it, it, that was really the the purpose of it. So if a, if a condition substantially limits um, either of those, then the individual may be uh, entitled to protection. Um, it also clarified that uh, Section 504 protects children with disabilities, whether or not those disabilities specifically affect the ability to learn. That's always been the case, but it's often been forgotten, especially because schools are more focused on the idea than on Section 504. Um, so it specifically added reading, concentrating, thinking, sleeping, which can be a big problem in migraine, communicating, a digestive, uh, there is such a thing as abdominal migraine, um, bowel and bladder you know, functions. Um, and it also precludes school districts from taking into account mitigating measures like medication. Um, so this is a very important uh, aspect of the ADA for you to know about if you have an invisible disability. 
Okay, so it seems like pretty much everybody has a plan, but let me just very quickly say, if you don't already have one, um, have your neurologist uh, get started with that testing process. The way that we did it was we took a letter from our neurologist um, and the neurologist recommended and referred uh, to um, psychoeducational or neuropsychological testing. And that was very important for us to have to go ahead and get the plan in place. Um, and, and what my daughter had at a private school is really the equivalent of a 504 plan. Uh, and many private schools will go ahead and, and do that. So that's, that's sort of the, that next step. But if you don't have that, we're gonna, I think you already have these slides. You can, you can follow that process uh, on your own. And then there are yeah, potential. I'd also go ahead, Haley. I'm sorry. Oh, so sorry. I'd like to add um, that right now there's one more type of evaluation that you could get called a set evaluation, S E T T, um, which I'm blanking on the exact letters right now since I don't have my notes on the computer. Um, Environment but, task force. Yes. Thank you. Um, but right now, given how much is on the computer on on the computer with virtual school, looking into what types of assistive technology you are eligible for um, can be a great way to get additional resources right now. Um, personally for me, when because reading was my biggest trigger um, and still is to this day, having assistive te technology to support me as a student was absolutely crucial. Um, and I'll return to that more when we're talking about specific accommodations. Yeah, and I'd kind of like to get to that pretty pretty uh, quickly, but I just want to say that in terms of the least restrictive environment, which is kind of the next, um, you know, area, uh, that, that really what, what uh, the, the school needs to, to uh, focus on with regard to migraine kids is that there's a continuum of placements. There are many different, um, you know, areas where you can be, uh, whether it's regular classes, or special classes, I think I'm on slide 28, um, a continuum of, of placements, um, including special schools or even um, instruction in the home, sometimes instruction in hospitals and institutions if you have to be there, hopefully you won't, but I know that many migraine kids do um, have to, to be there and I know my daughter spent quite a bit of time in the emergency department at CHOP. Um, the flexibility of setting is very important in terms of your plan whatever kind of plan it, it be. And um, I think being excused from a set number of absences is critical uh, wherever you are. Um, the, the doctor may have to be more involved if the school is stricter about that. Um, but that line of communication between you and the doctor and the school is one of the things that you really have to um, focus on. So um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's it. Oh, and then there's another um, aspect of uh, setting that Haley can speak to from experience. Yeah, absolutely. I was um, just going to add, I was homeschooled for the last three years of my pre-college education. Um, after some concussions, my uh, chronic migraines worsened to the point where I really was unable to keep going to school. And um, this isn't a first line option. It can be really isolating for a lot of students, but also being too sick to go to school is, you know, it is occasionally the reality. And um, with a mix of tutors on classes, cyber school options, and um, ultimately for me, a lot of dual enrollment classes. So I really recommend dual enrollment classes, whether or not you're homeschooled for students with migraine, because they can be a great way with many fewer hours in the classroom to knock out credits that will also count for college. So for example, I took some classes at community college and a lot of classes at Villanova University, um, some of which transferred and ultimately allowed me to take a lighter course load in college. So I think dual enrollment is a wonderful option for um, young people with migraine. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't you talk, if it's all right, a little bit about the, the college search and transition. Maybe I'll just jump in. When you... Yeah, absolutely. So um, as it says here, SAT and AC, ACT accommodations, these are much easier to achieve if you have a plan in school that you have been using, a 504 IEP plan. For example, I used um, 
I was able to take the ACT over the course of three weeks. I went in on the days where I was well enough and I had double time and I used audio recordings of all of the questions. So I wasn't really <laughs> myself. This is the most um, aggressive <laughs> set of accommodations um, and that's sort of a max you can get, but there really are ways to take standardized tests in the way that works for you and allow you to take um, take tests when you are, I won't say pain-free, but as low as, low as pain as possible. Um, when you are embarking on that college search, I also just recommend not being scared to ask a lot of questions on your tours. Um, you can even, if you're comfortable, stop into the Office of Disability Service on tours um, and know that all schools are different. The school that my sister went to and the school that I went to had very different approaches to serving students with disabilities. She went to Muhlenberg College. Honestly, I recommend that to everybody in the area who is looking for a school that is very accommodating and supportive of students with disabilities. As I mentioned, Penn was not so much. So it was a more challenging environment to have them understand who I was um, as far as a person with an invisible disability in addition to just as a student. Um, your doctors can be supportive in this process. They might have more information there and they will also be a crucial resource in helping you establish new medical care where you're located um, at your new school. For me, that didn't change because I'm from the Philadelphia area, but for a lot of people such as Maddie, John's daughter, um, sometimes you need a whole new set of specialists. Right. Um, I, I'll let John explain what Maddie did there or what Maddie is doing. Yeah, well, Maddie is taking a gap year because the school that she was going to be attending as a first year student, uh, Scripps, is, is all virtual and screens are not good for her migraine. But um, yeah, Scripps is out in Southern California and it was kind of an interesting thing. Um, until she took a trip to Costa Rica in January of her junior year of high school, uh, she didn't really know what her migraine triggers were other than some of the more typical things, you know, light and sound and so on. But um, the, the, when she went down there, she had a much, much better um, sort of baseline symptom. And she talked about it with her doctor when she came back and um, her, her neurologist at CHOP, who's just fabulous, um, recognized that most likely because she was much closer to the equator, it had to do with the fact that barometric pressure does not swing or vary as much when you get closer to the equator. So up here, there's a lot more variation than there is down there. Um, so she said, why don't you just, you know, check this out, see if you can visit some areas that, you know, have less barometric pressure variation. Maybe you can gather some data on that. See if you can find something on the net about it. Um, and um, then maybe if it turns out to be the case, find schools that are in an area of the U.S. if you want to stay in the U.S., you know, that have lower barometric pressure variation. Well, very quickly, she found this migraine sufferer who happened to be, a, I think, a medical statistician who had put together, just as a public service, all this data from uh, weather stations on barometric pressure variation, put it out there in a map, a color-coded map of the world, of how much you know variation there was, just for fellow migraine sufferers. And she said that of all of the posts that she had put, put out there on the web, this is the one that got the most comments on it because it was migraine sufferers all over the world thanking her for this data set that had not been available before. Maddie used it, found out that California has very little uh, barometric pressure variation with the advice of her neurologist visited, we, we happen to have family in Southern California, fortunately. Otherwise, I, I don't know exactly how I would feel about you know, not, her not having anybody nearby. But again, self-advocacy and with her neurologist's help, um, she looked at, I think it was five schools in that area, chose the one she liked best. It happened to have fantastic accommodation, Office of Disability Services, um, really good reputation for it, does have kids with migraine there who've been well served, and her neurologist helped her establish a relationship with a neurologist at University of Southern California, which has another comprehensive migraine center there that's uh, uh, accessible through public transit if she feels comfortable taking it 
uh, when she gets out there. So that's another way. Her search for college, in other words, was very different. Um, and I think many migraine kids' search for college is different. Uh, you know, what's most, what's most important to you is different than for a lot of other kids. Um, sorry, John, what's the question for me? I'm sorry, was there a question? I apologize. Yeah. Oh, oh, what I just said? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> you, you think it is? Yeah. <laughs> oh, whether my college for people with migraine, the search specifically or the college uh, experience? Yeah, the search. Do you think it was a little different? I'm sure it was different. For me, staying close to home um, was really the priority. It took a different approach than Maddie, even though, you know, maybe the change in barometric pressure would have been helpful for me too. But ultimately having, you know, a continuation of my medical care um, at the doctors I was used to, as well as being 45 minutes from home, uh, those were the most important things for me. And luckily, this area of the country is just chock full of colleges. There are a lot of options. So I know that it can feel limiting. Um, and I would just consider, you know, thinking about how if you're on a college campus, even if you're 15 minutes away, it does feel like a different world. So um, that can be a hard decision for some people, but, you know, think about the uh, opportunities that being close to home offers you. Um, think about your own, you know, your own needs, your own um, supports in various areas. Maybe you do have family. Um, everybody's situation is different, but people with migraine might have a different set of criteria than the rest of their friends when it comes to looking for college. And um, I too took a gap year and that was well pre-COVID. Um, so I had a different set of reasons that related to my migraines for taking a gap year. And I think gap years are a great resource, nothing to be embarrassed by. By the time you're literally a freshman, nobody cares that you're 19 instead of 18. No one will ever ask. Right. Um, right. So I'm a big advocate for gap years. Absolutely, yeah. So just this slide is just simply saying that it, it, the terminology is different and just, pardon me, you know, some colleges may say, well, we don't provide accommodations. Well, that's technically true. It's adjustments. They provide adjustments, but it's, it's essentially the same thing. So, um, yeah. To me, a great test question to ask a university before you attend is whether if you have to miss a test due to migraine, uh, due to your episodic um, chronic illness, whether you will be allowed to retake the test. At my college, the answer was no, because they said that was too big of an adjustment and it meant that you didn't meet the basic requirements of being a student at the school. I think that the answer to that question is indicative of the school's attitude um, and is something to keep in mind. Again, very apologetic for my dog. <laughs> um, I, I should say, um, I've heard not I'm only- I'm gonna go take- Sure, yeah, but, but also from, from several others that um, for those who are in the Philly area, uh, Muhlenberg is a good choice. But here is, here is a way that um, getting together with others, uh, whether it's uh, parents getting together with other parents, uh, migraine, you know, teen patients, students getting together with others, comparing notes is incredibly helpful. Uh, because this is the sort of thing that you won't really find in a guide. We actually did try to get a guide um, to schools that have good accommodation offices. Uh, but that focuses more on other things. And migraine is not featured. I wasn't able to find anything on the net. And I've, I've looked several times specifically about schools that are good at that, um, at, at accommodating for, for kids with migraine. So really, um, when you visit, I think not only going to the Office of Disability Services or whatever they call it, but also seeing if you can meet with another student who's there, who has migraine, and who has academic adjustments, accommodations for migraine is an important thing. So determining what those, um, what those adjustments are, um, I think that's, that's really important. And this is kind of where we're going with it, um, is just trying to, um, trying to find out um, exactly how uh, the school deals with it. And I think one of the things that you have to, have to know in advance going in is how the school deals with grievances too. Um, and so this is just a guide to essentially how you deal with that. And of course, you would go to the person who's in charge of that office. Um, but they have to have a process uh, for, you know, steps for dealing with it when that process doesn't result in uh, an outcome that's uh, something that you agree with and you think 
uh, is an appropriate resolution. Uh, so the, the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights does, does have a process for that. Yeah. Uh, great. This question, I'm not sure if we have a poll for this or not, Kelly. Um, if you want to just list in the chat before we launch into our uh, description of specific helpful accommodations, if anybody has a favorite academic accommodation that has really served them well, um, especially, you know, if that's testing extended time, great, let us know that. Um, it's, you know, it's great to hear from other students who think that's been helpful, but if it's something really creative um, that you haven't heard other people do, uh, this is a great opportunity to all bring our minds together and give each other new ideas. And John, we also had a question if that map you talked about that Maddie had, um, if you can make that available yes. for the people so, um, on the call. That's available at the end of the slides. And Kelly, are you gonna be sending out the slides at the end of the presentation? Yes, I sent them before and I can send them, I'll send them again to the people who couldn't make it as well. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, because there was a comment about not getting the slides. Yeah, these are great. Um, so the audio recordings. Yeah, yeah. Extended time. Sorry, I can't see them from where I am. So oh, I'm, I'm yeah. happy to hear you read them. And being able to retake for sure. That's something that was, was very helpful, I know. Um, Right. Teachers not forcing makeups on non-essential work. I think that's really critical. Um, and in fact, uh, that's something that Maddie had a little difficulty with because it puts extra work on the teachers to sort out what's essential and what's non-essential. But that's part of their job in uh, these sorts of plans. If you put it in the plan and th that's something that the school agreed to, that's part of the teacher's job. They may not like it, but they're supposed to comply with it. Um, good, having a break. Yes, having a break in the, in the middle of the day. Um, actually, that was something that Maddie also did at one time. Um, she would have um, sometimes half days, sometimes three quarter days, sometimes days with a break uh, in the middle. Did you ever do anything like that, Kim? Or Haley, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, that was something that before I was homeschooled when I was still um, in the school building in eighth, ninth, tenth grade, um, I had uh, a specific schedule that was built in a way to, um, you know, really allow me time to rest. So I didn't have two academic classes back to back. I had more free periods than most people did by having my elective requirements produced. And I did the electives I did have were positioned in a way so that I didn't have to have English, math, science back to back you know, those mandatory classes back to back. And I found that very useful for the time that I was um, in the school building. Yes, yes. Um, if we get more, are there any more? Um... I see low lighting, um, uh, tinted mm -hmm. lenses, of course, yeah. In fact, one of the things that, um, oh, prism glasses, yes, yes, helpful. Um, one of the things that um, <laughs> is kind of a, a neat part of the getting together, and I don't know if this is something, Kelly, that you all have done through these virtual things, but just talking about um, these devices, these things that people have found helpful, um, you know, certain kinds of tint lenses and, and you know, just comparing notes on, um, you know, who finds what helpful. Uh, there was also something that we found out about that seemed like a great idea. It didn't quite, in the implementation, it wasn't quite as good for, for us, but one of the things that I, I'll, I'll mention is that uh, a lot of the kids seemed, do you have this too, Haley? A lot of the kids at the, um, at the teen camp seem to have um, not as much of a sense of thirst so that they wouldn't drink as much and yet they need water. Water is incredibly important. You have to have, right, you have to hydrate. Exactly, I noticed that you are doing it, right? Whether that's, is that out of yeah. habit or thirst so or? <laughs> at this very moment, it's out of thirst, but um, I would say I had to really develop the habit and I had to have just, you know, constantly remind myself to hydrate. I've not, not heard that there's any, you know, different sense of needing, of being thirsty for right. kids with migraine, but certainly, definitely hydrating can be um, really useful. And so I try to go through multiple of these a day, every day. Right. Um, and at this point, it's just habit. I know there's a, um, there's a so to run. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
oh no, I was just going to run through some of the things that are written here, the ones that aren't totally self-explanatory. So permission to record classes can be an accommodation, but sometimes you do need to get permission from specific teachers and in college specific professors. But I find it to be really useful, even if you're not going to listen to a class every day, you're having a particularly migraine day and not feeling well at all and can't listen, but you can be there in person, you can get yourself in the door to record, um, that can be really useful. Um, there's also various software such as LiveScribe pens or um, just even the notebook setting in a Mac that will let you sync up to either the keystrokes on the keyboard or to the letters that you're writing on this sort of tech savvy paper so that you can go back and listen to a specific moment that you really don't remember or were not feeling well during. Right. Um, a lot of these are really intuitive. Note takers are particularly accessible in college. Um, that's a really common accommodation to get. Um, for either days that you aren't there, or days you aren't feeling well, or a day that you just, you know, like, were able to go and make sense of things, but weren't able to take notes. Um, we talked about the penalties, and someone else suggested that, you know, not having to make up work, um, not being penalized for missing classes, for missing tests even, um, preferential seating, um, digital audio formats of text, I find audible.com, learningally.org or com, I can't remember. Sure. And um, even just text to speech software um, and often your Office of Disability Services in college will help provide those digital copies of textbooks. So yeah. that's a great accommodation the, um, so that you don't end up scanning those by yourself. Yeah, you all had mentioned that um, in that first session and, and I have to say, um, I, I'm really impressed with both Learning Ally and Bookshare, which is another one. Both of them, I think, require a doctor's note to, to get into them, and that is because I believe they both have uh, federal funding um, that comes from the Department of Education attached to them, but both of them have a much broader range of textbooks, especially college and high school textbooks, than you're able to find on something like Audible. Um, so I would highly recommend getting that. Maddie did get that, and, and um, I was just very impressed with that. Um, there's another thing you were you were mentioning. I just wanted to jump in. Um, oh yeah, the um, the scheduling, um, having um, in your plan that classes aren't scheduled before a certain time can be really helpful for those who mm -hmm. tend to have worse symptoms in the morning. Definitely, and also in college preferential and in high school course scheduling means that you get first dibs. You go in before everybody else does to be able to handpick your schedule before class is full up fill up because you might have more specific needs for what your schedule looks like than other students. Um, if anybody has any questions about these, you know, you can follow up momentarily either by unmuting yourself or oh, um, I'm writing sorry, in the no, chat. I interrupt you again because we had said that we were going to say and we didn't say that um, if you have questions that don't make it in through the chat or the, that we talk about, go ahead and email them to Kelly and we will get back to you. Yeah, definitely. Because I know we started a few minutes late here, um, and I don't want to go too late. Um, testing accommodations. I made a whole slide just for these. Um, these were all things that I did at one point or another. 50% um, of extended time. I actually got 100% on uh, tests. Um, and those, that flexible scheduling of tests, um, not having more than one final a day, um, the breaks during the test, the special testing environment, um, the de directly in the test booklet is, uh, you guys might have had experience with Scantron bubbles. Um, those are so taxing to look at. Uh, they were really triggering. And so being able to just circle or highlight my answers instead was really useful. Um, and also you can get readers or sometimes audio CDs or text to speech during tests, which can be really helpful if reading is a trigger for you. Um, nope. as well as the decreased spaced out um, questions on a page. Your um, mentioning of the unlimited breaks makes me think, I don't know if we dealt directly with the ACT and the SAT, but that's something that I think a lot of the uh, students here who are going into uh, college will be dealing with, getting accommodations on those. And I think your experience was, am I right, with the ACT and Maddie's was with the SAT. Yes, for well, I took both actually. Right. Um, I got more and better accommodations on the ACT. I took it over multiple days. 
Um, a lot of people do find that, that you can have more accommodations on the ACT, but I certainly, I sold a reader on the SAT. I definitely had um, a lot of additional time. It just was all in one day. Yeah, right. I know yeah. that that was true for Maddie. They gave her unlimited breaks on the SAT, which meant that she had to take it separately from others because the proctor had to stay until she was done. Um, yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. um, we have one more poll right here. Kelly, do you mind pulling up the last poll? I think it's the last one. We might have one more. Sure, let me find it. I think I had a couple extra ones. I didn't know. Um, oh, okay, that's right, yeah. We just kind of- Which skipped. one is it, ha Haley? About how many hours a day do you spend on a screen? Okay. Okay, let me, sorry, hold on one second. No um, worries. Um, so just to give some context for this, um, Oh, here it is. So um, you can give context after, give you a second to read through this. Um, you don't have to spend too much time doing the math for this. It's not that important, but it is helpful and, you know, kind of gives us all an idea um, of what other people are doing as far as right now during COVID. I know we're all spending so much time on screens. Um, I have days at where between working all day on a screen and then watching TV at night and going on my phone, I feel like I've spent truly eight, you know, 12, 10, 11, 12 hours on a screen each day. And so I'm curious right. what you guys have to say. Yep. So six people say zero to four hours, three people say four to eight hours, and five people say eight to 12 hours. No one says 12 plus hours though. That's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, that's a lot of people spending four, eight, you know, nine, 10 hours a day on a screen right now. And I know that is so taxing, even for people who don't have migraine. Right. So I created this slide just for this of virtual learning tips that I've gotten from my own experience from, um, you know, other social workers, doctors, people in my life who help students um, who are struggling right now. So the 2020 rule is that every 20 minutes, you spend 20 seconds looking at something 20 feet away. So it means you find a point off in the distance that's at least 20 feet away. You focus on that point for 20 seconds every 20 minutes that you're on a screen. And that helps bring your eyes kind of apart so they're not so converged all the time, focuses them on something that doesn't have that harsh light, and just gives your eyes a break so they don't, you know, kind of freeze up looking at the screen. And I find that genuinely so useful. Screens at eye level is really important. So your head's not looking down at a screen. You're not looking your eyeballs in one way or another. Um, if you tend to use your screen in bed, that can often set you, you up for a really difficult neck strain position. Moving regularly, I read the quote that the next position is always the best position, that just moving, you're more likely to get yourself into a more comfortable, more appropriate position. The screen covers or blue light filtering glasses. Some people may use both. Um, those are something that potentially your school district might even end up paying for, um, as well as a laptop. You know, there are extra technology related resources that school districts um, might be more compelled to pay for right now. Flex and night shift are great ways to keep your phone or your laptop at appropriate levels of brightness um, in different settings. Um, I also really recommend working in as much natural light as you can find or a comfortably lit area. Not super bright, but also not in the dark because that the contrast then is so strong between your surroundings and the computer. Having a clean screen can be helpful and reduce strain. I always say, instead of limiting the amount of time that you're on a screen, because we don't really all have that option right now. Like I couldn't limit the time because I have to go to work, but taking intentional screen breaks and saying, I want to spend three hours a day that are not on a screen, rather than I can only spend six hours on a screen, that is often a much more positive, more rewarding, more attainable way to reduce your screen time. Um, getting permission as an accommodation to take yourself off screen to mute your video when you have a migraine is a really great accommodation that some students are getting right now. Um, having good, comfortable headphones is important using those accessibility apps and technologies as we were describing under normal non-COVID circumstances. 
And also just using more of all those accommodations that you typically, maybe you have them in your plan, but you don't usually use them. You don't feel like you need them. They're annoying. Right now, it's as good a time as ever to use all of your accommodations. John, do you have any um, additions for things that have helped you working virtually? Uh, you know, the, the only other thing that I think of, but I mean, there are just so many. We, we kind of all have to be creative in coming up with our own uh, accommodations, you know, during this time, uh, regardless of disability. But I, I really like something I'm using right now is um, the, um, the desktop standing desk that's adjustable, uh, just because it, it allows for that adjustment um, of the screen or the screens and of everything. And that really is helpful for my neck. I have pinched nerves in my neck. And so that's, that's just a really helpful thing. And I've, I've heard that that's a really helpful thing, as you just said, uh, for those with migraine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, John, what, what poll is this? Can you hear him now? Oh, so this is the, whether you have, so we have three questions here. Do you have accommodations related to COVID and remote schooling? Um, and if you do, um, if you could write them in, and is anybody taking a gap year? Thank you so much all for your speedy poll responses. It's really, everybody is really engaged in these polls, which I really appreciate. Yeah. Okay, so um, accommodations related to COVID and remote schooling, seven say no and two say yes. Um, I can go ahead Either and Either the two write in what they're getting. The next one. I'm trying to write it in. I can't find it on my phone about my accommodations. That's okay. You can time. share it. Do you want me to share you it? You can um, share it uh, right now. So he has the he has four classes in the morning. They're an hour long, and they're either A B days. One day they're remote. One day they're in person, and then they're online in the afternoon after lunch completely. And so the masks were bothering him, uh, making his headaches worse. So right. right now, this school, we had the doctor write a letter because they were giving us a hard time because they want, for one month, you have to sign up for either being online or um, remote. And they're letting him now bounce back and forth. Um, and if he doesn't feel well and he can leave the, the school and I can grab him and get him home. We live close by, fortunately. I can grab him in between classes and he can come home um, for class. So that's really helped him a lot based on whether he feels like going into class that day yeah. or not. So that's been, um, they were great with that. That's great. That's a great accommodation. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing. Sounds good. And whether anybody's taking a gap year, I know that we didn't even ask because screens are just triggering for pretty much everybody. So uh, we didn't even ask whether they are. Yeah. Right. <laughs> just assume. Yeah. Everybody <clears throat> says no gap year. Okay. Nobody said yes. Okay. Well, I'll count my daughter as one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. And then someone wrote in the comments, my daughter was forced to take a gap year. Um, because the school wouldn't accommodate for her needs for fragrance-free uh, okay. school. And there is one. Right, right. Wow. Yeah, there have been kids at, um, at these events who've had situations like that. Um, and it, it yeah. really, it takes a lot of creativity to, to figure out and to advocate and to try and get the school to, to do what it needs to do. And this is one of the uh, ways, maybe, maybe this is a good um, spot to just um, say, you know, that the kind of work that I do day to day with this law firm is about situations like that, where um, you're just, you're stuck. You're in a situation where the school will not do what is clearly the right thing um, and really should be doing the right thing, but it's just not. Uh, so you want to seek out somebody who practices educational law. And we, we are, as, as I said, uh, pretty much in all of Pennsylvania and Delaware and in the DC area, uh, but if you're not in that area, we could help you find somebody um, or you could, you know, seek somebody out yourself. It's a fairly small subspecialty. Uh, it's a, it's a, um, a field of civil rights uh, disability law, and um, it, it's, it can be tough to find people. But, you know, we know people, and so we can, we can help you out. Um, and um, often, and, you know, depending on, this, on the exact situation, 
because it's a civil right, an entitlement, a federal entitlement, um, attorney's fees are covered by the school if um, you win, if the, the firm takes on your, so, so in a situation like that, we would take on a case if we think you're gonna win because we think we're gonna get paid and it's the right thing to do and we're, we're here to help you. But um, that, that means that you don't have to worry about attorney's fees. But also, of course, you can pay the firm um, if that's not the case, if it's maybe in a gray area uh, where there might be some uh, question about that. Um, the I just skipped ahead to where your offices are since you were talking about Oh yeah, about right. It. So those are all the different, um, different locations of our, of our office. Our main office is in Berwyn, uh, which is on the main line west of Philadelphia, uh, but we have offices in, in all those other areas. Um, the resources might be worth running through, or at least some of them, uh, do you think? Um, but, you well, uh, I just want to make sure that we have time for questions, even in case some people are somewhere else they need to be, um, yes. since we are scheduled to be only have another minute or so, but I, I'm happy to stay on. John, if you are, to answer any of these questions. Yeah. Are we limited, Kelly, until uh, 3.30? Um, we can stay on later, okay. though I want to be respectful of time, so um, Likewise, yeah. for others who need to leave. Yeah. But otherwise, if people would like to stay on, they're welcome to. Let's take a look um, at the chat. Yeah. See. And also feel free if you'd rather state it um, you know, out loud, just unmute yourself and we'll um, hear your question. I and then if you also need to go, feel free to email me questions and I can also yeah. give those to John and Haley and get back to you on those as well. Yeah. yeah. I so, noticed some people have left. So thank you so much yeah, to those absolutely. people who do have to go. And I am sorry for that we ran late and I'm yeah. very appreciative that you came today and I hope you found it helpful. Yes. Thank you everybody for joining us. And let's just talk about some of these questions. This Ally Lamp, I think is, or Ally Lamp. I'm not familiar with it. Are you, Kelly? Ally lamp. A L A Y, a lamp. Apparently, it's a light therapy lamp developed by a Harvard neurologist for support of those experiencing so much screen. I'd like to look into that. Thank you for that suggestion. So, I would like to share that um, CHOP is having another webinar on November 1st, I believe. Kelly, you can correct me, but. Um, you know, a psychologist there was letting me know that that will focus on new treatment options in addition to more insight into specific ways to deal with virtual schooling. Um, right. And so you can definitely have more insight there about, about that, um, what that specific treatment option is. Good. Um, so a recommendation for Kalamazoo, I'm afraid I don't have that right now, but I can ask uh, and we'll get back to you. If you, uh, if we have your email, if Kelly has your email. The um, cephaly, is that how you pronounce it? Um, mm -hmm. Those machines, I know that they had them at uh, the teen camps that we went to. Maddie tried it and didn't like it in particular. What about you, Haley? I, I also did not like it. I also found it um, mostly painful. Uh, I'm, I'm really sensitive, but... Um, I did have a lot of use for the uh, transcranial magnetic stimulator, the TMS device, um, but also the company where I got that went bankrupt. So I might, I'm realizing not actually make that recommendation. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Um, I see there's a question about, so Maddie will be going to Scripps, which is one of the Claremont colleges um, outside of, of LA, Northeast of, uh, of LA. Um, I'm sorry. What am I saying? It's, uh, it's south uh, east of LA. And um, so, oh, and Haley, did you manage your math education with your reading and visual triggers is a question for you. So, um, Matt, I agree that math is really challenging with a with visual trigger, triggers because it's so hard to do it um, just over audio. Um, I would say having tutors who were special ed, you know, if not special ed certified had experience and were able to be creative in the way that they did my math instruction one on one um, was the best way that that worked. Um, I also um, found that by taking dual enrollment math courses, such as 
statistics, college level statistics, um, that was more friendly to my visual challenges than say algebra. Um, I can say that I have finished college and grad school and never taken even pre-calc, let alone calc, um, because you know, I took stats and stats too, and you know, that that was more friendly. So I recommend if you can look into stats as well as look on to, into someone who can uh, teach you one on one in math, but it, there's not a perfect solution that I found. But maybe someone who's really experienced as a teacher can help you with that. Right. Um, I know that um, that Maddie, my daughter, found it very helpful to have math tutoring kind of on the back burner. She um, when she was recovering from concussions, she had numerous concussions from um, what would in other people very likely not have caused a, a major uh, concussion reaction. Um, when she was recovering, uh, she found it really helpful to work with a tutor, a math tutor, and she kept that tutor kind of on the back burner and um, on call and would occasionally consult with the tutor and have a session with the tutor. And I think that was a, a very helpful um, aspect there. Um, so let's see, there's a, one or two others. Um, Pre-IEP, if we purchase assistive technologies, um, such as this e-ink screen, um, as opposed to an LED screen, uh, will maybe you get retroactive reimbursement through a, um, so uh, that's always a risk. I would say don't count on it. Um, it's it's unlikely, and yet, you know, it might be something to 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 try if you can prove that that's something that you absolutely need. Uh, there might be a possibility, but it's I think it's it's very unlikely. Um, did you ever get any kind of reimbursement for anything like that, Haley? Mine was never, to my knowledge, retroactive. I did get quite a bit of funding from my school district moving forward at a few different points um, for technology, but it was never, to my knowledge, retroactive. And I'll talk to my mom who might have more memory of that, and if that's not the case, um, I'll, I'll reach out. Um, yeah. by email. There was a question about uh, specifically how to get accommodations for the SAT or ACT. So there are um, specific guidelines that both of those organizations have on their websites about that. And essentially, you have to, um, you have, to have a psychologist um, uh, or psychiatrist write a letter that says that you meet these criteria after having been tested. Um, and, um, and as a private school student, if, if you're in private school, as, as my daughter was, um, you'll have to go ahead and pay for that. Uh, testing. If you're not, if you're in a public school um, and the, the doctor says that you need it, um, then the, the public school, if you have a plan, will likely pay for that testing. But that might be something that you have to argue about um, because pretty much everything takes advocacy. So back to the whole self out. Yeah. Two notes to add to that. One, I would make sure to give yourself plenty of time to try to get those accommodations. Start at least Start a year or more ahead if you can. Um, and also don't be too discouraged by a denial. You might get denied on your first try, um, especially with the SAT. If I am remembering correctly, at least several years ago, they kind of denied everyone first and they would do appeal. Um, maybe you need to appeal twice. So that's why you have to give yourself a lot of time and don't be too discouraged. Um, with the help of doctors and psychologists, you, you should be able to get there in the end. They do offer the accommodations, even if someone you talk to says they don't. Right. So I think that's pretty much uh, it. There's one other question about whether this recording will be on the website for review later, Kelly. Is that the plan? Yes, that will be. It takes a few days for Zoom to get it completed, and then we have to edit it with our um, with our person who does that. So in a few days, maybe three to four days, it'll be available. We, we'll do it on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. And then I'll also distribute it to everybody who registered for the event today. Excellent. All right. Well, thank Beautiful. you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Haley. It's just always such a pleasure. And, uh, I hope this was helpful for folks. Yes. And I wanted to draw those two names for the winners. Um, who will receive a free voucher for our upcoming Run, Walk, and Just Relax event. 
Um, so I'm just scrolling through and randomly choosing two people. So let's see, Grace, it looks like you are a winner. And, da, 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 and Bree. So you two, um, I'll be emailing you your free voucher code and that includes a free t-shirt. All you have to do is register with the code and you'll receive a free t-shirt and a medal. Um, so there's instructions for that. So thank you everybody for coming and look for my email that will be sent out soon um, with a survey as well as um, there'll be a link to all the upcoming events. Um, not to take too much time since we did go over today, but thank you so much to John and Haley. This has been an incredible event and super resourceful for everybody. And again, if there's any questions that come up that we don't have time for today, please feel free to email me um, and we will, we will get those answered for you. So thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Kelly, for hosting and planning these events. Um, so grateful that you are working with Miles for Migraine. Um, thank you again, everyone, for coming. And thank you, John. Thanks, buddy. Take care. All right, take care.